Good morning and welcome, everyone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God invites us to come into his presence and to worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and prayer, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord God, you led your ancient people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide the people of your church that following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated, please. Good morning. Our first reading comes from 1 John chapter 3. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as he is pure. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading comes from James chapter 1. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So, Don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word, and we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. 
One day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart, and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved Son, and you bring me great joy. The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness, where he was tempted by Satan for forty days. He was out among the wild animals, and angels took care of him. Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee, where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Be seated, please. I invite the children to come forward for the children's message. Tough decisions, where to sit, where to sit, right? Well, good morning, everyone. You guys all awake today? Some of you are, some of you aren't. I've got a question for you. Did you say you're lazy? You just want to be lazy, okay. Well, you know, Sunday is a, a day of relaxation. At least it, it should be for us. You were up until 1 o'clock in the morning? Oh, my gosh, were your parents happy about that? Did you get in trouble because you were up till 1 o'clock in the morning? I do, you don't know if you got in trouble? Oh, my gosh. Okay, well, then you must not have gotten in trouble. Now, all of you are children, right? Did your mom or dad tell you that you were a special child this morning? Why do I get the feeling you're being sarcastic with me? <laughs> Your parents say, I love you? Yeah? Okay. Do you get reminded that you are their child? No, you don't get reminded that you're their child. Do, do you? Do you forget sometimes that you're their child? You don't forget? Now, that's one of those things that you kind of go, well, of course I'm not going to forget that I'm their child. I live in their house. They're my mom and dad. I don't have to be told that I'm their child. Hmm. But sometimes it's important to hear that you are their loved child, right? That they love you because you are their child. We're starting this ser sermon series on reconciliation, and one of the beginning parts of it is for us to recognize simply whose we are, that we are a child of God, that he loves each and every one of us. We all know what God did for us, right? Send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. That's how much he loves us. It's important for us to remember that whose we are. Let us fold our hands, let's bow our heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness that you are with us every day and that you see that it is important for us to re be reminded that we are in fact your children that you love with an everlasting love. Help us, Lord, to have that sink in to our hearts and into our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You guys can all return to your seats. In this section of the hymnal, we have the whole of the small catechism printed there for our use. On page 325, we have the section on the sacrament of holy baptism. This was selected for today because this is the part of the catechism that gives us the clearest indication of whose we are. So I'll read the question, and then together we will read the answers. So what is baptism? Baptism is not just plain water, but it is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word, which is that word of God. Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. What benefits does baptism give? It works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this as the words and promises of God declare. Which are these words and promises of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. How can water do such great things? Certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water does these things, along with the faith which trusts this word of God in the water. For without God's word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is a baptism, that is, a life-giving water, rich in grace and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. What does such baptizing with water indicate? It indicates that the old Adam in us should, by daily contrition and repentance, be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires, and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Where is this written? St. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, as I mentioned today with the children up here for the children's message, we are beginning our sermon series on reconciliation. Now there is an organization that's called Ambassadors of Reconciliation, that I believe does some excellent work on the subject of peacemaking. In a few years back, we did a program that was called Blessed Are the Peacemakers. That is one of the items that they offer. What we're going to be doing here with reconciliation is simply one of the peacemaking responses. So I think it's wise for us to begin with an outline for reconciliation that's been created by Ambassadors of Reconciliation. So if you would show the first slide there, Wayne. It is in the form of a cross, and it has two directions. So you've got your up and down component, our reconciliation with God, and then the crossbar is our reconciliation with others. So the first part is to be reconciled to God. In the passage of 2 Corinthians 5.20, that we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled with God. Now that has three parts coming down. The first one, I don't know that you can see it or not. Uh, We will be using a handout eventually that's going to have this on the cover. The top part is remember whose you are, a subject for today. Second down is repent before God. And third is to receive God's forgiveness. So it works in that line of thinking. And go to the next slide, if you would, please. So the crossbar is being reconciled to others, and the Bible passage is, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift from Matthew 5, 24. So the three parts for that direction is confess to the other person, then forgive as God has forgiven you, And third is to restore with gentleness. So this is the outline that we're going to follow for the next six weeks. And you are invited to attend our Sunday morning Bible study that has the exact same title. 
uh, for more detailed information about this subject. And we'll begin next Sunday, so you haven't missed anything. And we will provide more detail on what I'll be preaching about today. So thanks for the slide. I, I suppose you could leave it up there for people to refer to as we go. It's, it's fine. So it's good for us to ask this question. What is reconciliation? And why do we need it? Now, conflict happens all the time in life. It could be anything from children arguing over how old they are. I saw this cute little video, a couple of two-year-old girls. One of them asked the other, how old are you? And she said, two. And the other one, so then she asked the other one, how old are you? Two. Oh, you can't be two. I'm two. No, you can't be two. I'm two. They're arguing over the fact of who is two because apparently only one person in the world is permitted to be two at a time. Oh, and you see children that are argue over playing with a toy. We would think it's pretty childish. You see children argue all the time over who can sit where in the car and who gets to sit where and, you know, all of these things. You guys don't, uh, you, Zach, you don't ever argue with your sister, do you? He is not, he is pleading the fifth. <laughs> Good choice there, Zach. These type of things happen. Our adults will argue over all sorts of things also. Anywhere from what color to paint a room, where to go for dinner, how about what you're having for dinner. You can't figure it out. Who's going to do this? We, we had an interesting discussion in, uh, in Sunday morning uh, the junior high Sunday school class. I knew I'd get the title out there right in a minute. We were talking about logos, and one of the logos happened to be spam. So who has had spam? You guys, is that stuff enjoyable to eat? It depends on who you are. I did my vicarage in Iowa, the home state of spam that was created for World War II. Uh, interesting uh, behind that. You know, people can argue over all sorts of things. What sports team is better? Now, there's a classic one. Uh, you, you guys all know who the best college in the United States is, right? It's the Ohio State University, right? And the Ohio State Buckeyes... I like that. Boo. <laughs> now, I know they're not number one in basketball. And, and last night I had a little fun with the fact that Don Eckert was there. And he's a graduate of Penn State. And Ohio State got their butts whipped by Penn State this week in basketball. Oh, boy. Happened to go to UB um, Friday night for a basketball game. That's a nice place. I've never been there before. Went to Alumni Arena. Nice, nice arena there. Now, this all might sound childish. The people would argue over such things. But it's amazing what people will argue over. Sometimes we think it's more worthy if the topic is more worthy, such as business or politics, the environment, money, religion. And see, oftentimes... Discussions become arguments that are filled with hurtful behavior. Now we're getting into trouble here. This especially happens when the problem becomes personal to us. It could be related to keeping a promise. It could be something or someone to whom you have a strong emotional connection. And when our emotions get <clears throat> set off... Well, then we react and we respond strongly. It could be a matter of personal integrity. Most people believe it's important to keep your word and to have a sense of good personal integrity. Now, having put forward what some of the items of conflict can be, I think it's important for us to make a distinction between conflict resolution and reconciliation. 
they are not the same thing. Conflict resolution addresses material issues, such as toys or money or property or roles, you know, who gets what, who gets to make what decisions, and these type of things, material matters. That's conflict resolution, and you use negotiation to solve conflict matters, uh, property matters. Reconciliation addresses relationship issues. So it deals with conflicts where you get into hurtful words, actions, gossip, avoidance, denial, etc. It's these relationship my items. So conflict resolution does not solve relationship issues. If you think you have, when you get the material matters solved, who sits where, that you've solved the problem, you're probably fooling yourself because you haven't really addressed the relationship issues. Reconciliation, likewise, does not solve material matters. It focuses on how do you heal a broken relationship. And almost any conflict will have both parts. And if you only focus on one, you've missed the boat. As you reflect on a relationship problem, it is good first to remember whose you are. And that's why we begin with today and our focus upon baptism, that we remember whose we are. After the sermon hymn, we did that catechism review of baptism. Now, I imagine for some of you, that brought back bad memories of confirmation class, right? Having to memorize all of that stuff. Uh, for others, you're like, ooh, yes, this is good stuff. It's not terribly complicated, at least I don't think. The whole doctrine of baptism is fairly simple. We are, every one of us, by nature, sinful, unclean, and an enemy of God, and that doesn't sound very good. We are in a bad position because we are separated from God eternally if something isn't done to fix the separation. The relationship has to be repaired. We're not talking about material matters. The relationship has to be repaired. Jesus came to reconcile each and every one of you to God through his holy, precious, sinless death and resurrection. And you receive the benefit of what Jesus did for you through the waters of baptism. In those waters, it is empowered because of the promise that Jesus provided in his holy word. That he has attached a promise to the water of baptism that it forgives your sins. That you are washed clean. And that you are made a child of God. The relationship is restored. In the waters of baptism, you hear, I'm sorry, in 1 John chapter 3, you hear, see how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. When I was talking with the children up here, I asked them if their parents reminded them that they were their child this morning, and odds are the answer was no. You don't, you don't have to be reminded whose child you are. It's kind of like drilled into you all the time. You see it every day. But then I ask, did your parents tell you that they love you? Ah, oh, now we're into a relationship matter. We just had Valentine's this past week. So, all of the guys, you did tell your wives that you love them. Right? Why, why am I getting blank looks? Did, did you guys miss? Should I ask the wives? Did your husbands tell you that you love them? Why is that important? You see, sometimes we just operate from assumptions. Well, 
She should just know that I love her. I don't have to say it. Hmm. But they like to hear it. They're, each and every one of us like to be told that we are special and that we are loved, and that's what God does for us in his scriptures. And it's important for us to remember what he has done for us, whose we are, and what he has declared. You have been forgiven. You have been cleansed. You have been brought near, called precious, and made a member of his kingdom on earth and an heir of heaven for all eternity. That's what God, that is what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. People love to hear what God has done for them in Jesus Christ. And people are very thankful that he has reconciled them with God. This impacts your life. You have been baptized into Christ with a purpose, though, so that you can walk in newness of life. Jesus leads you to put off the old sinful self and to put on newness of life in Christ. Or to say it another way, to do to others what Christ has done for you. You see, Jesus looks at you with eyes of love. Now, maybe you have heard of people looking at life through rose-colored glasses. You guys have heard that phrase before, looking at life through rose-colored glasses, that everything is rosy for them. Everything looks wonderful. And you wonder sometimes, do they ever see reality? Because it seems like they're living in a fantasy world. But see, that is actually how God the Father looks at you. It's through the eyes of Jesus Christ. When he looks at you, he sees you as one that has been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. Aha, uh -huh, rose-colored glasses. And he sees people with love. And he died for all people just as he died for you. So when you happen to look at somebody else that you are having conflict with, I think it's good for you to remember that they are people that Christ died for. Mm, sometimes we can forget that. They are precious people to him. You know how Christ has shown his love for this person, right? Because you know how he has shown his love for you. So he's done the same thing for that person. Now the question is, how can you show love for that person? Even though they have hurt you, how can you show love for them? When you have a relationship problem with a person, then you probably also have a relationship problem with God. So the first thing that you need to do is to be reconciled with God. There are several steps to take. Number one is to reflect upon your attitude and your actions. Sometimes we develop a bad attitude. We develop hurt, anger, envy, jealousy, whatever it might be. We get into a bad attitude, and that impacts our actions. Why does that happen? because there is something that you are idolizing in your life. It could be very well even one of those feelings that you have, that you are idolizing, that you are entitled to have it. Uh, there's all sorts of things that can become unexpected idols, and you're not going to discover it until you reflect upon yourself. An example might be, that you have some unrealistic expectation that you place on yourself or that you place on someone else. Number two, once you find that, you repent of your sins. We'll talk about that next week. And number three, that you receive forgiveness. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. We'll look at these, these type of things as the weeks come. But it is important for us to begin with remembering whose you are. That you are a child of God. That you are holy and precious, redeemed and forgiven. And so are the other people 
in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. As we pray together the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.